All right, well, thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to present. Uh, the title of this paper is Climbing and Falling Off the Ladder, Asset Pricing Implications of Labor Market Event Risk. Um, and the, the, the motivation for this paper, it's, it's going after one of the older and I think still very much contentious questions in asset pricing, which is to think about why is the risk premium? And when I say the risk premium, I'm just to be concrete, I'm thinking about something like the expected return on a broad market index, such as the S&P 500, in excess of a risk-free rate, such as the T-bill rate. Why is the risk premium is so large? And second, there's a fairly large literature that suggests that we think risk premium are countercyclical. So there's something about recessions that causes risk premium to rise. There are a number of explanations that could do this. We want to think about what some of the most plausible ones might be. One explanation that's been put forward is to think about rare events. And the motivating examples in the literature tend to be macroeconomic disasters, sometimes call these tail events because they're draws from the extreme tail of some distribution. And usually the distribution that we're thinking about in these models is something like the aggregate consumption, aggregate GDP. So the motivating examples are wars, depressions, financial crises, things like this. So the main challenge w in this literature and the main critique that's been put forward is that sort of the most important parameters, the ones that really drive everything in the model, namely those governing the probability and magnitude of these rare events, are fairly, fairly difficult to pin down to the data. Why? Because these events are rare. In the United States, we arguably only have one of these, the Great Depression, so it's pretty difficult to, to pin these, these parameters down. So what this paper is going to do is it's also going to think about rare events, but the, the example I have in mind is going to be slightly different. So I'm going to think about um, disasters that are cross-sectional rather than aggregate in nature. So the motivating example that I have in mind is something like losing a job in a recession. It's something like owning a business that defaults. These are shocks that don't hit every household in the same way at the same period of time, but they're very bad for the, the agents who experience these shocks. And there are sort of good reasons to believe that there's not very good insurance markets against these shocks. Um, moreover, there's an aggregate component to these. There are some periods of time where you're much more likely to see your wages get cut in half than others. And so there's a, a reason why you might think these um, changes in this, this distribution could affect quantities like uh, risk premium. However, when we think about testing these models, there's a very big distinction between this cross-sectional notion of tail risk and the standard disaster models. Why? Because tail events happen to someone essentially every period. Because we can see large numbers of households, we can look at the tail and treat the tail of that cross-sectional distribution almost as if it's observable, which is something we can't really do with consumption or GDP in the aggregate sense. So it may be easier to tie the key parameters of these models to the data. So what this paper is going to do is it's going to propose this state department sorry, state-dependent labor market event risk. So again, the, the idea is it's sort of an idiosyncratic disaster-like shock hitting different households. I'm going to propose this as a key driver of asset prices. The paper is going to proceed in four main stages. I'm going to shortchange the first one a lot today to focus so mostly on the, the theory. Um, but I'm first going to construct a measure of this idiosyncratic disaster risk. I'll show you that this measure is fairly persistent. It's highly cyclical, so these disasters are much more likely to occur at the individual level in recessions relative to expansions. Um, and these, these are really big shocks, sort of shockingly large. If you look at the, the amount of variabilities that households experience in their labor income, sort of the cross-sectional uncertainty is an order of magnitude larger than the aggregate uncertainty. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about how you could price these idiosyncratic disaster shocks. What I'm going to do is embed these idiosyncratic jumps. So I'm going to think of these as shocks that are zero almost always, but something large and positive or large and negative every once in a while, into an otherwise sort of state-of-the-art complete markets model. So in particular, investors are going to have Epstein's in preferences. And there can be a, a vector of aggregate state variables that govern the dynamics in the economy that they can follow sort of a general affine jump diffusion process. Um, Third, then, I'm going to start with the parameters that I've tied to the data from the first piece, and I'll plug them into a stylized model that features these rare but idiosyncratic disasters. What I'll show is that sort of a plausible level of this idiosyncratic disaster risk can generate a large time-varying equity premium that's consistent with the magnitudes we see in the data. 
Finally, I'm going to just test some necessary conditions that are implied by the model. Um, in particular, I'll show you that stocks are, in fact, a very bad hedge against this risk. Um, you might be worried that my story doesn't make a lot of sense if you saw, for example, that stock prices go up when, when people learn that they're exposed to more risk in the labor market. I'll show that that's, in fact, not the case. And second, I'll propose a new predictor of returns that empirically um, actually outperforms a number of predictors from uh, an empirical literature on stock return predictability. So this paper touches on a whole bunch of literatures, and I may um, continue in the spirit of many of the other presenters and, and skip a lot of it. Um, but roughly speaking, it, there's a literature that talks about how to do asset pricing with incomplete markets. And I'm going to lean very heavily on the contribution of Constantinidis and Duffy in 1996. And I'm sort of going to tie that mechanism in with um, sort of one of the standard models, sort of a long-run risk style model on the complete market side. And I'll show you that allowing for predictable variation and these idiosyncratic shocks when investors have Epstein's in preferences can really sort of change the answer that I think the main conclusion that people drew from these Constantinidis and Duffy style models. It's also going to relate to a, a fairly large empirical literature on stock return predictability. Yes? So the agents who are more likely to be exposed to these extreme um, liberal market events, aren't they the ones who don't participate in uh, equity markets in any way? So how do you so, so actually, that's, I, I think many of us expect that because sort of the likelihood of, ex say, filing an unemployment claim or things like that, definitely if you're a low-income household, you're more likely to experience those events. But actually, if you look at administrative earnings data, what you see is that it's actually the highest earners have the most cyclical, um, most cyclical labor market incomes, and in fact, they face more uncertainty than anyone else about their labor incomes going forward. I just think sort of the way that those shocks actually get measured in the data is different. So it might be that you, you are making $300,000 a year. Someone comes to you and says, your job's not going to be here three months from now. And so you have time to find another job. You're still going to experience a big loss in income, but you may never get measured as unemployed, for example. But when I do my estimation, I'm going to try and target the degree of income uncertainty faced by relatively high individuals. So these are people who are making, say, $100,000 to $150,000 per year. So those are individuals for whom I think human capital is probably one of the most valuable assets that they own, but they're not sort of so rich that I have no idea to say sort of to what extent I think an income shock might translate to a change in an individual's consumption. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Yes? Just a, an impression. So, uh, you know, uh, Anisha and George presented like a follow-up paper at the uh, asset pricing meeting. And just in, in, in regards to what you said now, too, it just it almost strikes me and I wonder what your opinion is to push even further that it's it may be even not even just like the guys making three hundred thousand but the super rich that uh, probably are most exposed to the market that you also see a lot of variation in the outcomes there I mean yeah. we don't feel sorry for them because maybe if you go from making you know many millions to somewhat less millions but it's I think the theory I mean unless I'm wrong the, the theory goes through this more or less the same so. Yeah, and in fact, I have a, a slide that, that gets at that. Um, if you look at some of the calculations that have been done on looking at the incomes that the really, really rich folks are getting, um, you see, OK, so the people like Bill Gates, I have no idea how to think about Bill Gates within a consumption-based asset pricing model, potentially. Um, but even he is sort of exposed. He has large idiosyncratic positions in single stocks. But if you go down even a little bit lower in the income distribution, you still see that the top 0.1%, something like 75% of their income in a given year is coming from wage or entrepreneurial business investments. So it may be, so the split could be businesses they own, but I think there's still this notion that if you own your own business, that business is more likely to experience a large uninsurable shock and recession. So I totally agree. And in fact, the intuition of the model that I'm going to present is not going to be heavily dependent on that. One reason why I'm going to think of maybe a little bit lower in the income distribution when I calibrate a model is just because I need some estimate of the extent to which an income shock is going to translate to a consumption shock. These people aren't in any of the data sets that we would use to try and estimate that. OK, so let me go back to where I was. OK, so just to kind of give you a sense for what the data look like, what I'm showing you here is a picture that's 
showing the, the time series variation in the cross-sectional distribution of labor income growth rates. So this is coming from a fairly involved estimation calibration procedure where I'm trying to characterize the uncertainty faced by these relatively high earners. But you can interpret this just like a box plot. So I want to talk about uh, idiosyncratic risk, sort of things that after I've already taken the mean out. So I'm just going to normalize this distribution so that it always has median zero. zero. So the zero line just corresponds with the median income. And then what I'm showing you is the 25th percentile, the 75th percentile, uh, the 10th percentile, the 5th percentile, and the 2.5th uh, 2 .5 percentile, and symmetrically above. And then I have the usual NBR recession bars that I've overlaid here. So again, this is showing that the cross-sectional distribution of changes in income over a one-year period. The first thing to notice is just the scale is massive relative to what you see for GDP growth or consumption growth in the aggregate. This is 60%, right? So, so what this estimation is suggesting is that 2.5% um, of individuals might very well ex experience a 60% decline in their labor income. Moreover, it's quite cyclical. So if you look at the recessions, what you see is the, that the right tail, or sorry, the left tail of this distribution is expanding dramatically, while the left tail is, or sorry, the left tail expands dramatically and the right tail is shrinking. Finally, it's really sort of concentrated among a small fraction of people. What it seems like is the business cycle has a very limited impact on the labor incomes of most of the, the households in, in the economy. In contrast, however, if you happen to be someone in the extreme left tail or the extreme right tail, whether, you're, whether we're in expansion or recession makes a really big difference. What, so what this is suggesting is that recessions really sort of, those impacts are concentrated among a small fraction of households in the extreme left tail. And when we think about doing asset pricing, that's going to be a huge amplification device. Why? Because in the complete markets model, a recession looks something like GDP drops by 3%. In this model, that 3% could be a weighted average of zero for almost all households and say minus 30% for a small fraction of households. And you're willing to pay a lot more to avoid a recession if it looks like that second case relative to the first. So how persistent are these shocks to um, So the, the, the goal of the S... Yes, so, so this is gonna be a Constantinidis and Duffy style model. So, in, and there's a fairly long tradition in labor of trying to estimate processes that are some of a persistent permanent component, so random walk component, and then a transitory component. I'm basically gonna try and estimate a version of that model. And so ultimately when I do asset pricing, it's just gonna be permanent shocks hitting households. So, so yeah, the, these are, in the data you can. The guy who's losing 80% is gonna. So, so what's interesting is actually if you, Think about very, very high earners. If they experience a very large drop in their incomes, it's very likely to be persistent. You can look, say, 10 years later in the data, and you'll see that they haven't gotten that money back. Um, in contrast, if you look at the left tail of the cross-sectional distribution, so poor people, if their incomes drop by a lot, it's very likely that they'll sort of rebound to where they started. And if they experience a big increase, that's when it persists. So, so actually, there's very substantial evidence that, that when you see people experiencing these big drops, that it's going to stay with them, essentially, for the rest of their careers. OK, so, so again, I've, I talked about this already. What I'm basically going to do is estimate a parametric model for idiosyncratic income shocks. When I, but my theoretical model is going to be a consumption-based asset pricing model. Agents have Epstein's in preferences. Um, there's going to be a law of motion for some state variables. So it's going to look like a long-run risk-style model. Um, so when I think about what income or what consumption shock I should throw into the model, I'm going to take this income shock, I'm going to multiply it by an elasticity. So this is sort of the pass-through of income shocks to consumption. I'm going to take a fairly low estimate from the empirical literature to try and be conservative, and that's going to be the consumption shock that goes into the model. So the advantage of doing this is, again, you get a lot more precision. You can look at big samples, and the time series dynamics are going to be much easier to filter out relative to, say, the CEX where the cross-sectional dimensions are so small that you get a lot of noise. All right, so, so in the interest of time, I'm going to skip a number of additional details about the, the uh, estimation. This is the big picture, though. Uh, there's individual agents are assumed to have a 
a labor income process where sort of if you strip out all the life cycle and aggregate components, it's basically two pieces. The first is a random walk component. This is a permanent change in people's incomes, and then a temporary or mean reverting component. I'm just going to try and estimate the distribution of the shocks, these permanent shocks, coming from the, a number of statistics that I can get from administrative earnings records to try and show you how much that permanent component is changing over the business cycle. Okay, so that's going to, let me skip some of these details because I'm worried we're not going to get a lot of time to talk to the theory and go to the, uh, the main punchline. So, so what I do is I construct a measure which would be proportional to say the probability of experiencing a large positive or a large negative shock in this model. So, so these are jumps, uh, that's how I'm thinking about them, they're shocks that are almost zero zero almost all the time, and then occasionally something large and positive or something large and negative. So you can basically estimate with a regression a measure of the probability of experiencing one of these nasty shocks. This is the estimate that comes out. And again, as you see, that this, this measure, which is proportional to the skewness of the cross-sectional distribution, is very cyclical. Right? So if you look in each one of the recessions, you see that the skewness uh, falls dramatically. It's also quite persistent. Right, so there's, there's substan substantial time series variation in these measures, even in periods where, say, we're, we're not in a recession. So, so this, this persistence, I'm, I'm then going to use in a, a long-run risk style model, where there's a persistent variable governing the likelihood of experiencing a nasty shock in the labor market. And because agents have Epstein's in preferences, they're going to want to hedge against bad news about this state variable. Just to understand the process a bit more. So once you lose your job, you can lose. Once you get the shot, you can get it again and drop it further. That's so right. So you could learn. So that's, that's a little bit controversial, but do you think it matters? Or um, I, I mean, as long as the, the probabilities are sufficiently low, that's not going to be happening a lot. Um, so I'm trying to, those, are, those people are going to be in the very, very extreme quantiles of the, the distribution, and I'm going to be looking closer to, to the center. So I don't think it's going to have a massive impact on the results. But yeah, I mean, the probability of getting one of these shocks is sufficiently low that the probability of getting two is essentially zero over. So, so what I, ultimately the process that's being estimated here is this permanent shock to an individual's wages is going to be a sum of basically three things. The first is a shock which is zero almost always and something positive every once in a while. I'm calling that the good jump shock something that's zero almost always and something large and negative every once in a while. This is the bad jump shock, it's sort of like a, this idiosyncratic disaster. And then sort of a state dependent small shock that hits every period. And then I estimate a model where basically the probability of experiencing a good shock in a recession is much lower and the probability of experiencing a bad shock in a recession is, is much higher. Right, so, so you're basically shifting probability mass from the right tail of the cross-sectional distribution to the left tail when you move from expansions to recessions. Just to show you a picture of what this, what this looks like, what it comes out of the estimation, I'm showing you the densities of just the permanent piece that's, com that's coming from this estimation of people's changes in wages and expansions and recessions. And so th the densities are on a log scale so that it's easier to, to see the tails. And what you see that's really striking here is that the center of these two densities are essentially laying on top of each other, right? So, the median person in this economy is not really affected very much at all by the business cycle, but the changes in the relative thickness of the left and the right tails are, are quite substantial, and that's what's going to be driving the amplification in the model. Okay, a second thing I show in the paper is basically that if you look at my measure of the likelihood of experiencing a bad shock, uncertainty about this measure, this cross-sectional skewness, is also changing over time. In particular, I show that the rate at which individuals are losing jobs in the cross-section is a very good predictor of time series uncertainty about this state variable in the, the future. Why do I need to talk about uncertainty at all? Well, in these models, the risk premium is constant unless there's conditional heteroscedasticity in the state variables that Asians care about. So I do a number of tests to sort of show that this measure is in fact heteroscedastic and predictable by initial claims for unemployment. Okay, so again, this is, was my roadmap for the theory. Let me talk about how this pricing works. So, just like any asset pricing models, our starting place is the Euler equation. So the expected return on a given asset is gonna be coming from the correlation between the pricing kernel, or this MT plus one, and an individual um, asset's return. 
In the complete markets model, um, agents receive an endowment, delta CT plus one I, that just grows at the same rate as the aggregate endowment, delta CT plus one. Right? Agents in these, in these models are assumed to have the same preference as ex ante, and if there are complete markets, then everyone can arrange with one another to basically ensure that all their uh, consumptions grow at the same rate. So with Epstein's end preferences, there are two terms in the Euler equation. The first, uh, which is just coming from contemporaneous consumption growth. This is um, what we often refer to as short run risk. So this is the only term that survives with power utility. Um, so if an asset is a bad hedge against aggregate consumption risk, agents care about that. And then there's a second term that comes from a difference between relative risk aversion and the intertemporal elasticity of substitution. And if you make this parameter restriction, where the coefficient of relative risk aversion is bigger than the intertemporal elasticity of substitution, and both are bigger than one, you basically get that agents are willing to pay some money to hedge bad news about these state variables in the future. So if I were to learn that, say, aggregate consumption is going to fall a year from now, holding my current consumption fixed, I'm willing to pay something to hedge against that bad news. So what happens with incomplete markets? Well, there's sort of two shocks now that agents care about. The first is this, the standard complete markets channel. This is governing the growth of the pie as a whole in the economy. Um, that's delta CT plus one. But there's a second shock, which is coming from redistribution of that pie across different households. So I'm denoting this by eta T plus one I. And if you assume this restriction, then aggregation will hold properly. So basically, this eta T plus one is a mean preserving spread. And the thing that's going to be interesting about it is sort of the higher moments of this eta shock are going to be changing over time. And in particular, in my model, it's going to be the skewness of this that's changing over time. So is that all consumption ratio here is the same for all agents, right? Yes. Is that a cause for concern? So, so this, these, these Constantinidis and Duffy models lean very heavily on homothaticity. The advantage then is you don't have wealth distributions that are floating around. Um, but yes, it's, that, that is a, a prediction that comes out of the model that you know, if you were to measure different types of households, things like that, I'm sure you would see it violated. Okay, but this is, the way I think about this is the incomplete markets analog to the complete markets model. So if you're willing to assume that agents look exactly the same ex ante and then are just ex post different because they receive different shocks, then you can sort of um, close the model very quickly just as easily as when we had to make the, the assumption about complete markets. I mean, the assumption of the complete markets model is going to be clearly violated in the data as well. Right? We don't see all households' consumptions growing at the same rate. Yeah, so the idea is that what I'm trying to do is collapse all of the effects of something like losing a job into a single shock that hits you instantaneously. In reality, what we think it probably is is there's a shock, series of shocks that unfold over time. With Epstein's in preferences, when the EIS is bigger than one, I don't think households care terribly much about the consumption smoothing aspect of it, but it's going to affect sort of the magnitude that's reasonable to throw into a calibration. And if we, there's nothing about your model that tells us we should rethink the EIS to put a that on bigger than one story. I mean, I, I mean, it's, I mean, it's hardly uniform agreement that I agree. So the, the direction that you see stock prices moving that's generating the covariance is consistent with the EIS bigger than one. So the way that the price dividend ratios are behaving over the cycle is consistent with the EIS bigger than one. But I agree, this is model, it's, it's chassis is very similar to a long run risk style model. So what, what I'm essentially going to show is that sort of long run risks in these redistribution shocks or the higher moments of cross-sectional uncertainty behave very similar to long run risks in the mean of aggregate consumption growth. So the intuition is very similar. The comparative statics turn out to be pretty similar as well. All right, so, so ultimately, how does, how does this work for asset pricing? Well, here in the pricing kernel, there's a term that, that's I-specific, right? There's this A to T I shock that's different across different households. So ex post, different households' consumptions grow at different rates. What I'm going to do is sort of a standard trick in these incomplete markets models, which is that I'm going to project out uh, people's beliefs about this, uh, these mean preserving spreads that are hitting them into a single state variable, which I'm going to denote by nu t plus 1. So one way you can think about these models is there's sort of a compound lottery floating around in the background. First, we draw the aggregate state variables, things like aggregate consumption growth, aggregate dividend growth. And then there's a second lottery which sort of redistributes output across different households. 
And this is how much a household who's a CRRA utility maximizer would be willing to pay to avoid that second lottery. So if you plug that into the Euler equation, it's essentially changing the units from infinite dimensional space, which is a to t plus 1 is in the space of distributions, to just a scalar that's in the same units as aggregate consumption. So households are willing to pay a to t plus 1 to avoid these, these redistributional risks. And the thing that's really going to amplify risk premia in this model is sort of in the standard Constantinidis and Duffy model, agents have power utility, so this term is gone. So the only thing that could generate this risk premium is a contemporaneous covariance between um, either aggregate consumption growth and these returns, or these higher moments and returns. So, so in my case, you still have that channel working, but you also have that there are these hedging demands floating around. So if the state variables governing these higher moments are persistent, which I showed you a lot of empirical evidence suggesting that they are persistent, then these hedging demands are potentially very different in my model relative to the, the complete markets version of the model. I'm calling that the indirect effect. So there's a direct effect. This is the, the, what was emphasized in the earlier literature coming from this direct covariance between the two. There's also this indirect effect that turns out to be quantitatively very important. Um, I also provide in the paper so that you can solve this model, it's, the solution is very straightforward. Um, you get affine solutions. You can also derive an inter intertemporal CAPM um, representation, where you can basically show that agents are willing to pay a premium to hedge news against these uh, certainty equivalents into the future. OK, so then the, the model that I, I present to sort of give you a sense of how much this amplification could really be doing affecting risk premium is going to be a stylized model that features rare but idiosyncratic disasters. So this redistribution shock that agents receive is going to be the product of two things. This nt plus 1, which is essentially a dummy variable. It's going to be 0 almost all the time, 1 every once in a while. And then a normally distributed random variable, which is giving sort of the size of the disaster hitting households. So in terms of parameters, I'm thinking about mu b as being sort of a large negative number. Um, and sigma squared b as being a fairly, fairly large variance relative to, say, aggregate consumption. And the thing that's going to be interesting from an asset pricing perspective is that the probability of receiving one of these rare idiosyncratic disasters is going to be state dependent. In particular, I'm going to assume that there's a state variable xt, and the probability of receiving one of these shocks, or the Poisson intensity, is going to be um, decreasing in xt plus 1. So I think of good positive x's as good states. These are expansions. Negative x's as recessions. So this is just saying that the probability of a disaster goes up in a recession. Then the aggregate dynamics are going to look just like the bond saw your own model. Um, so there's going to be aggregate consumption, aggregate dividend. Both of these two things potentially load on this business cycle state variable so that maybe dividends are falling in recessions. Um, and then each of these, this variable xt plus 1 is an AR1. And if you want to talk about return predictability in these models, you need stochastic volatility. So I'm going to have a stochastic volatility process, sigma squared t plus 1, which is an AR1. OK, so this looks just like Bonsall on your own. But the thing that's going to be different is aggregate consumption is really going to be not doing very much in my model. So aggregate consumption is going to be essentially unpredictable in this model. I allow for a tiny location shift which is basically sufficient to say that if you don't receive one of these jump shocks, your consumption is unpredictable. Because otherwise, because these eta t plus 1s have to have mean 0, you would sort of be shifting the consumption of everyone else in the economy up a little bit in bad states of the world, which would be a little counterintuitive. That doesn't turn, to, turn out to drive the results by very much. OK, so when I calibrate this model, what I do is I just start with those time series that I showed you in the first part of the talk. So there's this xt state variable. Its empirical counterpart is just that, that xt line graph that I showed you. Its AR1 parameter is just the first order autocorrelation of that xt process. Um, the sigma squared, my empirical proxy that I use for that, is the rate of initial claims for unemployment, which I provided some formal justification for its use. And so what comes out of that is that these things are persistent, but they're not as persistent as you need state variables to be to get them to work in a complete markets model. So one way to think about persistence is to calculate the half-life of a shock. Um, so this is, say, xt is one standard deviation above its mean today. How long does it take for xt to be one half standard deviation above, above its mean? 
And in my model, that's about 1.4 years. In the long run risk calibrations I'm showing here of Bonsal Yaron and bon Bonsal Kiku in Yaron, those, those half lives are a little longer. So in Bonsal Yaron, it's 2.7, and Bonsal Kiku in Yaron, it's 2.3. Similarly, my sigma squared variable is sort of less persistent than you see in, in the Bonsal Yaron or Bonsal Kiku in Yaron models. Uh, so the half life of a volatility shock in my model is three years. So everything is less persistent, but I'm getting this amplification that's coming from the fact that sort of ex post, these XT, these, these bad XT states are going to be concentrated among the households that receive these disaster type shocks. Um, okay, so the thing that's really important to generate a risk premium is stocks have to be bad in some way, right? There has to be something that causes stocks to fall in recessions. Otherwise, when people get bad news about their labor incomes, they would like to save, so everyone's going to push into stocks and that should drive prices up, generating sort of the wrong covariance. So the way I do that is going to be the same as Bonsal on your own. I assume that when XT is low, expected dividend growth is low. And so that's going to make stock prices fall in recessions. So the thing that I need is actually um, dividends to be fairly predictable at short horizons, just to generate a covariance. Um, and so in my model, basically, dividends are very predictable at short horizons. They're not predictable at all at long horizons because this XT isn't very persistent. So sort of the duration of expected dividend growth is much shorter. Um, so the parameter that I ultimately plug into the model is basically going to assume that in the long run, dividends are about as predictable in my calibration as they are in these bonds all your own models. So in particular, if XT is one standard deviation above its mean, that would tell you that, say, my forecast of total dividend growth or long run dividend growth into the future is 21% higher than its mean in my model. In the Bon Salle, your own model, that comparable number is 25%. And then you can think about discounting those sums and the numbers change, but the main punchline is that dividends have to be about as predictable in my setup as they are in Bon Salle and your own. For better or for worse, people fight about whether that's reasonable. Um, ultimately, all that's doing is it's making it so that stocks do badly in recessions, which empirically we know is the case. That you have uh, already, you've taken a stance on your proxy of the conditional variance. You could provide evidence from the data by running the regression of future dividend growth on, on unemployment claims. Have you done? So it would be nice to have sort of a data column in this table, and have know what what that number is. Yeah. So that, I mean, you, you tie your hands over to the unemployment claims. I agree. So so we have to take a stand on what the what cash flow measure we think is appropriate vis-a-vis -vis the model. Um, what I do show is that the return covariance is the way that you want it. So all this is really doing in the model is it's just making it so that stocks fall in recessions, which we know happens in the data. So I think those covariances are about the right order of magnitude. Um, in this simple setup, the way you do that is by making dividends predictable. I think there are richer models where you could do that through other channels, but I don't think the intuition would be very different. But I, I can do that. OK? Um, so ultimately, what are the parameters that are showing up in this model? I'm assuming that households have about a 2.6% chance of experiencing a shock that has a mean of minus 18% and a volatility of 12%. So these are fairly bad shocks that are hitting households. That translates to assuming that the pass through from income to consumption is about 23%, which is in line with an estimate from Blundell, Pistaferi, and Preston coming from data from the PSID. Households still have to be fairly risk averse in this model. Risk aversion is 11 and the IES is 2. Um, yes? So actually, I think this pass rule, when I saw the model, you had a simple cross form. The pass rule to from consumption to a permanent income shock is the share of your total wealth that is your human capital wealth. Yes. yes. And the estimates of those things, they look like 23 percent. They'd probably be higher. So if you, if you get a higher, if you assume a higher pass through, then you'll get that households are willing to pay even more to avoid these shocks. But what I'm afraid is, like, when I in terms of income, usually it's like you want to think about 80% of your income is labor income. So if we think that translates somehow to wealth, it would be four times higher than what you are. Yeah, but actually, actually, something that comes out of this model is that labor income is incredibly risky. And so it's through the, this lens, you might actually argue that the discount rate on labor income could be higher than the discount rate on stock market income. 
basically because they're these fat-tailed shocks, you can't insure against them. Sort of you're, you're forced to hold, hold these assets, and that can pull the, the weight down. But I agree, a similar portfolio analysis could answer that. So some main punchlines that come from this. Um, you can always compare my incomplete markets model to the representative agent version by just shutting down the, uh, the disaster shock, set the variance to zero and the mean to zero. Um, and what you see is basically the risk premium in my model, 6.5% on an annualized basis, which is roughly double the risk premium that you would get in the complete markets version of this model. It generates lots of excess volatility. Uh, return volatility is higher than dividend growth volatility. Having these incomplete, these uninsurable shocks um, makes risk-free risk assets more valuable, so the risk-free rate goes down. You also generate more volatile risk-free rates as well. Um, and another thing you can do is you can calculate something like the dividend yield for an individual's consumption stream in this model, and you get that basically consumption is much riskier in this model. So the standard model would say that if you're consuming $100,000 today, your human wealth is probably something like $10 million. Whereas my, this calibration of the model would say that your human wealth is more like $1 million. Um, some things it's not going to match is I don't have anything persistent, so the autocorrelation of things like the price dividend ratio is going to be much lower than the data. Um, and also, uh, dividends are fairly autocorrelated because I mentioned that you have to have sort of a lot of predictability of dividends at, say, a three month horizon, but not much at a five year horizon. Okay, so then in the last section of the paper, I basically show two things. I'll just say the first and then show you one picture for the second. So the first is I show that this initial claims measure, which is my proxy for uncertainty, in fact works quite well in forecasting returns in the future. So if you compare it, R squared, say, or T statistics from forecasting regressions of it relative to a number of competitors from the empirical literature, so the Goyal and Welsh variables is what I use. You actually show that at short horizons, initial claims for unemployment outpredicts them all, and outpredicts all of them except the term spread at, say, a one year horizon. The second thing I'll show you is that stocks are a bad hedge against this um, uninsurable disaster risk. So, with the parameter configurations that are standard in, in this literature at least, um, the market earns its risk premium for, because of one of three things. It's either a bad hedge against aggregate consumption risk, so it positively covaries with news about current or future consumption. In my model, there's an additional channel that households care about, which is if they get bad news about the higher moments of this cross-sectional distribution going forward, um, that can also generate a risk premium. And finally, if the market is a bad hedge, about, bad hedge against future uncertainty. What I do is I use a regression-based method to estimate um, impulse response functions. So the these are coming from projections, but the interpretation is the same as, as a standard impulse response from a VAR. I show how much would I revise my forecast of these different variables if the market was above, unexpectedly above its mean by, say, one standard deviation. So that's about 8%. If the market goes up by 8% unexpectedly, I revise my total forecast of aggregate consumption growth upwards, but only by about half a percentage point. So it's a very small magnitude. Um, in contrast, uh, my skewness index, which is normalized to have standard deviation one, I showed that an unexpected market return actually causes, is quite informative, informative about skewness, say, a year from now or six months from now. So there's, there's fairly strong evidence of the covariance here, and the magnitudes are big because this is a persistent variable with standard deviation one. Similarly, as is well known, the market is a bad um, hedge against my uncertainty measure, which I'm using initial claims for unemployment. So I'll just leave this up here. Thank you very much. Could I ask you, if you shut down the risk of necessity in the aggregate, mm -hmm. your model should still have predictability, right? Because you have these time bearing probabilities of uh, shocks arriving. That's going to give you hit risk of necessity in individual consumption growth that varies with the aggregate space. So, so it's, it's only if it's actually the, the, so you can show that these certainty equivalents are basically affine functions of the state vector. So if the shocks to the state vector are uh, heteroscedastic, then, so I think the, the if I could look at the. Is, is there, no, so, so let me ask the question differently. The, the, these arrival rates of idiosyncratic shocks, the lambdas, they depend on the x, which is aggregate. I would have thought that that alone introduces um, Heteroscedasticity in individual consumption growth that depends on the aggregate state. So, so there would be predictability in my model of uh, 
if you could see prices of human capital, there would be predictability there. But there's the physical capital, which is orthogonal to these heteroscedastic shocks, actually would, would be homoscedastic. So, so like if I could, because the, the only thing that's heteroscedastic is this uninsurable idiosyncratic shock. Um, but the returns of things like the market index actually only depend on the state vector. So if shocks to the state vector are homoscedastic, then the market return is homoscedastic. Um, and the projection of the pricing kernel, so the thing that new t plus one that entered the pricing kernel, that is homoscedastic as well. So you have sort of the standard Epstein's in result that if there's no homoscedasticity, you don't have predictability. However, I'm working on an extension that has um, sort of time varying sensitivity of these uninsurable idiosyncratic shocks to the aggregate state vector. There you can actually generate a model that looks sort of like internal habit persistence. And in that case, you can have time varying prices of risk and return predictability, even in a case where aggregate shocks are IID. Yes? I'd like to ask you a big picture question. Now, one assumption that this constant thing is that the sellers make is that everybody's at their margin. Everybody's on the margin and everybody's relevant for pricing assets. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you look at the unemployed people, the people actually lose their jobs, how many of them even have any positive assets? Because an alternative interpretation for your findings goes as follows. Whenever I see a spike in skewness, that pushes a lot of people against the borrowing constraints. Right. When that happens, interest rates drop. If now I make a heroic assumption of log or something to keep the overall return of capital the same, that automatically will mean that the equity premium is going to rise. So the question is, are we looking at, um, I, I, your fact is exciting, no doubt. Okay? We know these correlations with the schemes and all that is interesting in its own right. Um, I'm just wondering about the explanation. I would like <coughs> to see a little bit more on whether we actually believe that this fraction of the population that loses its job is marginal for the pricing of aggregate rates. But that's why I, my starting point was to try and estimate an income process using the best data I could get for high earners. I think people who are making $200,000 a year or $300,000 a year, they're exposed to this risk. There's substantial cyclical variation. And I think their savings uh, choices are going to reflect changes in that, that idiosyncratic risk. So I agree, like 50% of the population, they could get fired. They may own zero wealth. They're not on the Euler equation. But I think for really high income people, um, which you know tend to be driving wealth, there's still substantial holdings here. And Uvin and has some direct evidence on this. So yeah. it kind of looks at the composition of the biggest shocks, and it comes from two places, the extreme high end and the extreme low end of the income distribution. Yeah, we have to make sure that for those same people, those same people can't save and, and, and like, we have to make sure that that really passes all the way through, through the consumption. This is a model about consumption, not income. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. So the other thing that's true for a lot of those folks, even people who are billionaires, they may hold massive undiversified positions in their individual firms. If, yeah, but we know that we also know that firm we know that firm level idiosyncratic risk spikes in recessions, and these types of models can be used to think about that as well. But if there, you're going fine. If that's the interpretation you wish to give, I'm perfectly happy. Yeah. So I mean, recessions are bad for a lot of reasons. They tend to push in the same direction in these types of models. So the yeah, thanks.